going to welcome you. Oh, sorry. All right. I'm very happy. I'm Senator Sandy Pappas from St. Paul, and I'm very happy to welcome the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor to join DFL Women Legislators with us here this morning. We have some key issues that we're going to be talking about that we think are of particular interest to women in the state of Minnesota. Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. I was getting ready to say, you know you're having a press conference with women when the whole wall is covered with purses over here, so I feel at home today. I want to just briefly thank all of these outstanding women leaders for um, um, not only being here today, but for the work that they that you do every single day to draw attention to the core economic issues that half of the population of this face the state face every day around housing, around transportation, around child care, around health care. These are all not women's issues, they are economic issues. And I'm so grateful for the leadership that you show every day. And I'm frankly disappointed that we're not able to make more headway this year on, on um, policy issues that affect the quality of life of families um, every single day. So thank you for your work. And I look forward to hearing more about what you want to um, speak with us about today. Thanks very much, Thanks, Governor. Well, I share the Lieutenant Governor's uh, admiration for all of you, and if you added up all the years that you've served in the House or Senate, all those years that you've devoted to improving the lives of women all over the state of Minnesota has just been heroic, and I thank you and salute you for all that. You know, just briefly at our meeting earlier, you know, learned, for example, that the uh, Republican majorities have uh, el eliminated funding for the Office of the Economic Status of Women in the legislature, something that was not considered in either the uh, House or Senate bills, not voted upon in the House or Senate, and slipped in conference committee. And I've asked my staff to look into this practice of slipping things into conference committees that haven't been voted on either the House or Senate. It's truly really deplorable, in addition to being deplorable that they would eliminate funding for this one person office who does a lot of good work. So it just shows how uh, absent the proper priorities are for uh, the economic status of women, the social status of women, and why uh, your courage and leadership is more important now than ever before. So is that uh, Senator Kent? Right here. All right, Thanks. get out of the way here. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm Susan Kent, State Senator from Woodbury, and I'm really grateful to be here today. I want to thank Governor Dayton and Lieutenant Governor Smith. Um, they have shown such strong leadership on these issues that affect the economic security of women for years. Um, and because we all know that when women are economically secure, not only is it better and more fair for them, it is better for their families, and it is better for Minnesota. That's why we are here today to ask for their help on of, two issues that affect women's paychecks and their working lives. First, we're asking um, for opposition to the preemption proposal that Republican majority is pushing, the one that would strip local governments of their authority to respond to the needs of their communities, particularly their ability to improve our workplaces. The focus of the preemption bill will disproportionately affect women workers by putting limits on paid leave and the minimum wage. In Minneapolis and St. Paul alone, more than 150,000 people will lose earned sick and safe time. And in terms of minimum wage, more than two-thirds of minimum wage workers are women. Second, we are disappointed that the Republican uh, majority has not extended paid family leave for state workers, some of whom are on leave right now, at this minute, but they're having to make plans to cut that leave short if we cannot extend this important benefit. Our workplace policies have not kept pace with our changing way of life, and that means many workers are forced to choose between caring for loved ones or bringing home a paycheck to meet basic needs. No one benefits when workers have to make that choice. While DFLers in the House and Senate have championed parental and family leave bills, Republicans have worked against programs that help women stay gainfully employed and become more economically secure. Eliminating earned worker benefits is penny wise, but pound foolish. We want the best and the brightest working for Minnesota. We are doing them and the state of Minnesota a disservice by not funding paid family leave. Thank you. Thanks. Carolyn and Diane. Well, uh, I'm Carolyn Lane uh, from Columbia Heights, a senator. Uh, valuing the need for clean and fair elections in our, for our state candidates, Minnesota acted 40 years ago to lessen the influence of big money and special election money in our campaigns. We created a campaign finance program that set limits on candidate spending. This created an even and fair playing field 
and it kept our elections accessible to the ordinary citizen, including those often less wealthy and less connected into deep pockets, which oftentimes are women and minorities. And we made some, we have made some progress in electing people who do represent the diversity of the, our state. In order to have these spending limits, we constitutionally must have candidates voluntarily sign a notarized agreement that they will abide by these limits. Having done so, they are then able to receive a public subsidy that can do, be about 10 to 20 percent of their spending. This entire program is at risk in the proposed Republican bills of this session. Instead of continuing to keep our campaigns and hence our legislature open to the diversity of women and minorities, the loss of this program would create a spending race. And in a couple of elections, the price of the, the ordinary, would price the ordinary citizen out. A couple of elections later, you wouldn't recognize our legislature. Along with this high spending and influence of special interest money comes, would come voter cynicism. And this cynicism would even threaten our high voter participation. What a downward spiral. We have several women in our legislature right now who, at some point in their pasts, experienced the need for government services to help stabilize their lives. They were then able to flourish after that and now are here serving, giving back. The sense of service to the people through our shared value and effective and efficient government is so different from those who come to the legislature to attack government willy-nilly because they think it's the enemy and they have all the answers. I do recognize both proposal perspectives have value, but the former service-oriented one is easily lost in elections that are all about the power of money. We need spending limits to have clean and accessible elections that allow all of us to participate in how we do government. Good morning. I'm Representative Diane Loeffler, and I have the pleasure of representing part of Minneapolis. And we were, had been now reaching a milestone in 2020. It will be 100 years since women got the, the right to vote. And yet only a third of our legislature is women. And unfortunately, in the last election, we stepped back in the, number, the proportion of women serving in our House and Senate. Um, collectively. We think that we should represent Minnesota in all of its diversity, not just in parity by gender, but by our racial disparities, by our life experiences, our age and generation, and our economic status. And we know from both academic experience and my experience in trying to recruit candidates that the discussion about, well, how would I fund my campaign? who would support me um, is oftentimes the make or break decision for people who come from low income families, who don't have wealthy connections, who don't want to be dependent on outside special interests. It's also important that we keep our clean and accountable system. The bills before us defund and strangle many of the processes of the Campaign Finance Board, which has always transparently kept all of us accountable in terms of reporting all the money that we raise, the money that we spend, and give gives us, by agreeing to spending limits, access to public funding from people who oftentimes could not give in any other way but checking off that checkbox on their income tax. And having people step up is really about believing that they're gener they are joining a clean and fair system. Um, right now, politicians aren't the most popular um, in the polls that show out there. And part of that, it, in min except for the governor, <laughs> and, and, and he's earned it, and we're proud of him for that. But we think that getting candidates from non-traditional backgrounds to step up is really about their believing that it's about public service, and it's about entering a campaign process that is fair and accessible to everyone in Minnesota, and we think that that should be the outcome. We thank Governor Dayton for his commitment to, to only authorizing bipartisan election changes, and, and we look forward to an outcome that keeps our system ad admirable, accountable, and fair. Thank you. I'm Representative Connie Bernardi, and I represent the community in which I grew up, Fridley, New Brighton, and Spring Lake Park. I'm here today to draw attention to, we are here today, I should say, to draw attention to that the Republicans' budget bill that they passed eliminates the funding for the staff for the Office on the, security, on the Economic Security for Women. This is one person. This basically ceases the, the ability for this office to function. 
And this is something that goes against Minnesota's values. And silences the voices of women across the state of, women, of Minnesota and their economic security. This office was created to help women and girls, every woman and girl of all ages and all backgrounds, the ability and the opportunity to achieve economic security. They provide, they're the only entity in Minnesota that provides analysis across broad spectrum of public policy issues that affect the economic security of women. They help legislators draft legislation that create a level playing field for women to achieve economic security. We stand up here today in our fight for women's economic security in the state of Minnesota. This bill completely disregards improving the lives of women that the Republicans have passed. It defies Minnesota's values of equity and justice. We as DFLers stand with women and girls across the state of Minnesota, and we are gonna work for economic security for women and girls and we will work hard to tr make sure that this legislature prioritize the funding for the Office on the Economic Status of Women. Thank you. And with that, I want to introduce uh, Deputy Leader Rena Moran. The office has helped me elevate the issue that transportation is a women's issue and an economic security issue. They traveled first time around the state of Minnesota on their tours and found out that that was the biggest barrier to women's economic security. Rena Moran, uh, Leg Representative Moran has been a leader in the economic security of women of color and indigenous people, and I want to sh have, she's coming to share her story about her work. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Serena Moran, representing District 65A. So as you have just heard, the Office of the Economic Status of Women advises the legislature and provides information and statistics on women in Minnesota. The office gathers information on population characteristics, educational attainment, and enrollment, marital and parental status, household characteristics, labor force status, and employment characteristics and basic information on women, legal, and, eco and economic rights. It was through this office that I reached out to get information on my pay equity bill and also my Women of Color Opportunity Act bill. Through this office, I received facts, data, and research on women in Minnesota and across the country to better inform my work on the needs to create more fair and just opportunities for women. Through the work of OESW, our state learned that women of color are robust participants in indigenous women in the labor force. 75% of Hmong, African American, and African immigrant mothers with young children are in the workforce. 65% of Mexican mothers and 62% of Somali women age 16 plus are in the labor force. They are the primary family breadwinners. And again, they are the primary family breadwinners. 80% of Minnesota Native Americans, African American, and African immigrant women with children earn the majority of their family income. So Minnesota white women make about 78 cents to the dollar. African American American immigrants, African immigrants women earn 62 cents to every dollar that a white man earn. Hispanic women make about 57 cents to the dollar. Somali women earn 54 cents to every dollar that a white male earns. And Hispanic women working four times stand to lose almost $854,000 dollars over the course of her career because of the gender wage gap. These facts are real and they help inform how we as legislators need to move our state forward on the behalf of girls and women. So we feel compelled to point out that the elimination of the Office of Economic, Economic Status of Women staff is part of a disturbing trend by this Republican-led legislature to silence the voices of women, particularly women of color in the lawmaking process. 
the Office of the Economic Status of Women has become an invaluable source of research and policy expertise for members of this legislative body who are working to improve the lives of women. So closing this office now, at a time when progress for women and girls is under threat, would be a major mistake. So I hope as the governor and the Republican continue to negotiate and work out their differences, that they restore funding to this critical resource for women across Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. Um, so now we'll just take a few questions on our three issues, the paid family leave issue and earned sick pay, local preemption, clean elections, and the Office on the Economic Status of Women. And then after that, I'll turn it back over to the governor. Any questions on those? Um, we did just come from a discussion with the governor, but that wasn't part of our discussion. <laughs> well, you'd have to ask the governor. <laughs> yes, yes, the governor behind me said yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much for attending. I think we're, my sisters and I are going to leave through this door, and then the governor's going to take over. Right, thank you. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, governor. Thank you governor.